everybody. We appreciate you joining us today for this uh, webinar on deep cleaning of hard surface floors and getting your customer to take the next step beyond the Swiffer, Mop, or Auto Scrubber. I want to welcome everybody and introduce a couple of guests. Uh, Mike, you're muted, but you want to say hi to everybody. For those of you who don't know Mike, he is our Eastern Regional Sales Manager and our national account, Mike. Uh, Mike is down and you just got back from a trip to the coast, so you should be all tie, tan tested and ready, right, right Mike? Yeah, we're all good to go, Doyle. Thanks for the uh, quick introduction there. Yeah, hey, everybody, glad you guys are joining us. This is, uh, I think, a very important topic with what's going on in the world today. And uh, hopefully Doyle and Dane will do a great job. And uh, I, I kind of been around this business with auto scrubbers and mops and buckets for a long time. So uh, I'll chime in uh, if, uh, if I have something to say. But again, thanks for everybody for coming on and, and joining us. Thanks, Mike. Well, I want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us and introduce our speaker today. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to get to know Dane Gregory, Dane and I, like many uh, of the uh, people in this industry, go way back. We've been kind of riding this horse together over the past uh, 25 years and in, in developing a better understanding of, of the role of deep cleaning and creating a healthier environment. Dane knows a lot of the same people that, uh, that I do and has been involved with some of the things, but he's also done some things that I haven't. For instance, he, he's past president of the IICRC. He's uh, been deeply involved in owning and operating his own janitorial building service contractor, cleaning company, restoration company. And today he is... Uh, uh, works with the Carpet Cleaner, Cleaner USA, which is the uh, distributor of the industry's most popular uh, CRB, counter-rotating brush machine out of Austria. And he also operates his own consulting business, uh, DaneGregory.com, where he's been doing a lot of online training. And later today, he's going to tell you all about an uh, upcoming schools that he has. And kind of tell you the difference between attending a, a stone masonry and tile, an IICRC stone masonry and tile class online and in person. But Dane, welcome aboard. Why don't you say hi to everybody? Thanks, Doyle. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, middle of a Monday afternoon for me. I'm in the central time zone, so I'm a little bit later than uh, what Doyle is. But uh, yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I've been home now without being able to go out uh, since March and do the um, in-person training and my wife and I have been playing this very interesting game called why are you doing it that way uh, it's a bad game because nobody wins and the prizes are just horrible so uh, I'm looking to get out of the house at some time very soon so we can all meet together somewhere and have some fun I think that that game is going on in a lot of households right now uh, Happy, happily married couples are spending more time together than they have in a long time and rediscovering the way they do things differently, huh? I believe that's correct. All right. Well, it's great to have you, Dane. I, I, I appreciate you joining us today. I think your level of expertise in this subject matter is, is monumental. Your background in, in stone and your background running your own business, uh, you're just the perfect person to help me. Uh, talk about this message. So let's get rolling. Um, I do, do want to point out to all our listeners that uh, all of our webinars are available at Hydromaster University, which is on our website. Um, and so if you missed our previous webinars, uh, we've got a lot of COVID-19 resources. And really, we've been doing all the webinars. Sean, the one I did with Sean Bassayon, the one I did with John Braun, and then all of the supporting materials are moving beyond just the COVID-19. It really is talking about deep cleaning and cleaning for health as, uh, you know, how to do it and then how to market it. So we've covered carpet cleaning. We've covered commercial carpet cleaning. Dane and I today are going to talk a lot about hard surface cleaning. And then in a couple of weeks, I'll tell you more about that at the end of our presentation. Uh, Doug Heiferman and Tom Monahan are joining me to talk about rugs. So looking forward to, uh, if you want to check out those resources, you can. I also always like to start and end the, the uh, webinar by letting you know what you will be getting after the show is over today, so to speak. 
because we want you to focus on the information being presented, not worried about what the PowerPoint is saying or if you can get a copy or of this or that. Everything we're gonna talk about today is, uh, is going to be available to you and you will be sent a link on how to download all of the different materials that we're gonna zero in on today, including a, a, a nice little tile and grout pre-inspection form that Dane was nice enough to share with us to provide to you. So we're gonna introduce you to some things you might not have seen before in the marketing section, but we also have some links to procedural information. Obviously in a 90 minute webinar, Dane and I can't teach you from start to finish how to deep clean every type of hard surface floor, but we do want you to know where the resources are so that you can do that. And I think another desired outcome, we're gonna talk about that today, desired outcome, any time that Hydromaster is, is doing a webinar is that at the end of the day, you know where to go to get these resources so that you can implement some of this stuff in your company. So this, uh, if you saw the agenda ahead of time, we're gonna talk about some different things. We're gonna talk about uh, the, some of the investigation and research that's been going on on hard surface floors that look clean. And this predates even the COVID-19 outbreak. And then we're gonna talk about what is, what's the difference between deep cleaning and regular cleaning. Dane's gonna spend some time with you talking about pre-inspection. And I, where I really ask for Dane to help us today is to, especially for the newer people, and newer meaning you're newer to hard surface cleaning. It doesn't mean you, have to be new to the carpet cleaning business, but help understand where do you draw the line between all this stuff that you hear about, uh, you know, between repair and correction and resurfacing and grinding and all these things. Uh, we're gonna be talking about deep cleaning today, but Dane's gonna help you understand where some of those lines are. And then we'll talk, uh, show you some re places to get step-by-step -step procedures for do, to do deep cleaning of each of these surfaces. Then we're gonna focus in on the marketing side of it, how to help you grow your business in this area and what types of things are working for other companies that are out there. So if you look out in the, in the marketplace right now, you know, if you take the residential home, the, the, um, the literal onslaught of, de of hard surface floor cleaning tools, just you go down the aisle at any Best Buy or Walmart or any place like that, you'll see a whole litany of tools that are now made specifically to wash and clean hard surface floors. But most people are still using a mop or a Swiffer vat or something like that. And then on the commercial side, it still astonishes me how many places are just, are still using a mop and bucket to try and clean hard surface floors. And then taking the next step up to an auto scrubber and, and that's it. So we're gonna talk about how to bring this deep cleaning concept into what's traditionally done on these. The other thing that Dane and I wanted to make sure you understood is because this can differ by literally geographic area of the country or the world in that case, since we've got some people on here from the UK and potentially Australia and New Zealand, um, of the different types of flooring materials and how they, that so many different types of floors now are made to look like another type of floor. And that comes into the pre-inspection process. So you've got traditionally the ceramic tile and porcelain tile with grout that most of you are familiar with. But when we get into stone, this can be much more regional in what you're dealing with. But you've got mar marble, flagstone, sandstone, granite, slate, travertine and serpentine are all different types of stone floors that you may encounter. And then you'll find stone also in fireplaces, countertops and bathrooms, and that's just touching into the residential market. In the commercial market, you've got all the potential for all that tile, but now you've got finished concrete. It can be polished concrete, but it can be residential finished concrete too. It can be stamped concrete, made to look like a stone or tile floor. And then we're also going to touch on today a little bit about luxury vinyl plank. Our good friend Jim Manas at Shaw Industries 
I did a webinar a couple of weeks ago with Bill Yaden on floor coverings and things like that and talked about some of the statistics and the way that luxury vinyl plank is taking over not just the residential market, but the commercial market. And at first glance, you may be thinking, well, that's not good for me because nobody deep cleans vinyl plank. We're going to talk about that. So one of the things that uh, uh, we're, we want to zero in on to start with is some research that's been ongoing. It started last year when I met with a company that is manufacturing a a water recycling system. And uh, they are trying to develop a system that can take wastewater from the cleaning process. Right now they're zeroing in pretty much in the janitorial world with auto scrubbers and devices like that. But obviously there's a potential long-term for truck mount wastewater. And they were looking at this, how to use this water re on location water recycling technology so that, that cleaners could reuse water during the cleaning process. Well, that investigation and study and research is ongoing, but one of the things that they caught my attention with was a study they referenced in which they found, they were doing analysis of wastewater in auto scrubbers in a big box store. And they were finding tracked fecal matter, that's poop for those of you who don't like the scientific words, tracked poop hundreds of yards away from the bathroom in a big box store like a Home Depot or a Lowe's or Menards or even Walmart, hundreds of yards away from the bathroom. Worse than that, when they did further testing Sometimes they would find that even after the floor had been deep cleaned, they were still um, finding high levels of fecal matter on the floor. Well, I kind of set that to the back burner in the sense that that's something that our industry needs to take a look at, but it came up recently again when the Cleaning Industry Research Institute held a webinar uh, at the very beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak, one of the things that, that uh, uh, their, some of their scientists and doctors talked about was this same concept of restroom cleaning and hard surface cleaning and what's on a hard surface floor both before and after it's been cleaned. And again, this subject matter of tracked fecal matter came up and how far away from the bathroom they were finding this. So I started doing some research, and one of the things that I found is the, the hard surface floors may look clean, but we're beginning to understand better that that doesn't necessarily mean, because they look clean, that they're free of unwanted matter, soil, germs, bacteria, and obviously in the day and age of COVID-19, viruses. So a couple of things that we've learned during this research. Studies show that wiping or mopping a hard surface floor can spread as many contaminants as they remove. If you're not familiar with this research, a great place to go is a company in, that's really in the, in the Jansan industry called Kyvac. For those of you who aren't familiar with Kyvex technology, they developed and uh, patented a touch-free, a no-touch bathroom restroom cleaning system. It's basically a mini pressure washer system that washes off bathroom surfaces without the cleaning technician having to come in direct contact with them. And that, so they've done a lot of research and just some of the research that's on their website is available to you on this screen. And remember, we will be sending you a copy of this PowerPoint so you can go check these out. But this is right off of the Kyvac website. It says wiping surfaces such as desks with rag sponges and conventional cleaning cloths, as well as mopping floors with stream mops and buckets can spread as many contaminants as they removed. And it goes on to talk about that a hard surface floor 
can have two to eight times more soil. So that's the first thing that caught my attention. I knew about the Kaivak research because Kaivak is heavily involved in the cleaning industry and talks about it all the time. But as we began to expand upon this, we found some other things that clean looking floors have been found in various studies to be a reservoir of microbes. This is an article that was done uh, with the National Institute of Health. And I wanna to read to you from the summary. It says, in summary, our exploratory study found that floor surfaces tended to be heavily colonized by bacteria especially soil-borne bacteria. And again, back to the fecal matter. Fecal contamination was prevalent on the floor surfaces, especially dog-specific fecal bacteria. So that led me to do some more research. Over 90%, first off, a study was done that showed that over 93% of shoes that we all wear have some sort of fecal matter on them right now, no matter how hard you clean them. And that that fecal matter is being demonstrated to transfer to hard surface floors throughout a facility. Well, obviously there are two major sources of this fecal matter. Fecal matter from public restrooms and fecal matter from animal poop, primarily dog poop, that's outside in the grass or the yard or on the sidewalk or in the parking lot, and people step in it and track it throughout a facility. Here's a study from, that's quote, been quoted by a lot of different people. The University of Arizona has a microbiologist named Charles Gerba, and I see his name coming up again and again in the studies. Let me read you, it says, I'm starting to make myself paranoid. It seems like we step in a lot more poop than I thought. For the study, 10 people wore brand new shoes for two weeks before they were sampled for bacteria. They found fecal bacteria on 96% of the shoes. The fecal bacteria indicated frequent contact with fecal material which look most likely originated, as I mentioned, in public restrooms or in contact with animal fecal matter indoors. But here's what, the, uh, as he said, ahem, uh, the kicker is. The transfer rate of bacteria from shoes to clean tiles was over 90%. So what are we learning? we're learning that hard surface floors, even when they look clean, may not be as clean as we think they are. The other thing that if you've been attending these webinars on COVID-19, you hear this reference over and over, the Center for Disease Control, Dr. Fauci, the World Health Organization, the research microbiologists addressing our industry, they keep talking about touch points, touch points, touch points. And they never talk about floors as a touch point. But studies show that we touch contaminated floors as many as 50 times per day. If we know that these shoes are contaminated that we're wearing and we're tying them on a regular basis, if we rock around on these hard floors with bare feet or sandals or flip flops, we're obviously picking up this. Plus, the studies are showing that Mark Warner, who was with the Department of Homeland Security, estimates that we have as many as 50 direct and indirect contact with floors every day. This comes from an article in Food Quality and Safety Magazine. And finally, we're finding studies where they've really focused in on what kind of bacterial contaminants are found on hard surface floors and what can we do to remove them. Well, if you think about it, who is probably the most concerned with potentially infectious agents 
on hard surface floors. Well, it would be healthcare, hospitals, doctors, nurses, even the people who work in these hospitals and healthcare facilities. Here's a research study that was published in Infection Control Today, where Dr. Naveed Sala noted research that he did on hospital floors. I won't try and read to you all these different types of bacteria and viruses. The point is that there are a lot of contamination, bacterial contamination on these hard surface floors and that contamination is transferring to hands. So now that we've defined that perhaps the problem is bigger than just does the hard surface floor look dirty, the first route of treatment that most people would immediately jump to take is, okay, well, can't we just spray disinfectants a lot more than we are? If this is a potential, potential problem, that these contaminants exist on a hard surface floor, can't we just spray disinfectants? Well, I don't have it on your screen, but today in Bloomberg.com, there's another article that just came out where two research doctors are expressing their extreme concern about the overuse and overapplication of disinfectants as the result of the COVID-19 outbreak and all the people that are being told to spray disinfectants. We know that disinfectants can cause problems with people that have respiratory irritation or that, is a, that are asthmatic. And these problems are, are the health-related effects of overexposure to disinfectants. All you have to do is Google disinfectants and health, and you'll see a lot of the articles. But Do Thomas Tincotti, who's the director of Ryerson School of Occupational and Public Health, took it a step beyond just the fact that these disinfectants the over-application of disinfectants may create a problem. He doesn't think they're working. And that was one of the things that the article in Bloomberg is saying, is that getting the disinfectant on the, the right surface, surfaces which are likely to be touched a lot in the correct concentration in the dwell time that the disinfectant calls for, to kill the organism in a way that doesn't cause additional safety risks to workers or the public can be challenging. And that's what's coming out more and more, is that you have the disinfectants and the concern about what they're doing, and then the concern that many in our industry are expressing as these disinfectants aren't being applied properly, they're not being allowed to dwell the proper amount of time that it takes to deal with the bacteria or viruses on the surfaces that they're being sprayed onto. So, once again, we come back to what we started with, with carpet cleaning and touch point surfaces. We know that COVID-19, according to the research microbiologists on the Siri webinar, are often encased within other materials. So we know that. We know that that means that just spraying a disinfectant may not penetrate through those other materials, the saliva, the spit, the fecal matter. So we know that deep cleaning, just like the, the Center for Disease Control, is the answer with our hands, with touch points. It's also the answer for hard surface floors. So what is it that we mean by deep cleaning? Well, we know what Dr. Barry said about carpet cleaning, that the deep cleaning process in carpet cleaning focuses on a wet, high temperature, high flow, high extraction system. We know that in Dr. Barry's um, studies and the research that he did over a 25 year period, that using this deep cleaning process on a carpet was effective at reducing bacteria and viruses at a high rate, I think we can make the conjecture 
that it works on hard surfaces. So let's focus for a quick second on what we're talking about with deep cleaning. Well, the big two things that I think most people overlook, most people understand water-based fl flushing, they understand high temperature, that higher temperatures are good, but I think one of the things that people have a tendency to overlook is high flow. Now, when Dr. Barry talks about high flow, he's not talking about PSI. He's talking about flushing gallons per minute of water going across the surface. And then also a high extraction system, the ability to pick up and remove the water that you've put down and all the unwanted substances and take them back to a waste tank where they can be stored and properly disposed of. So we know that deep cleaning is part of the answer. And I wanted Dane to talk to you for a minute about what we know that can be done in measuring clean. At several of the seminars and webinars have talked about using ATP meters. And, but ATP meters effectiveness on carpet can definitely be called into question. I think there are ways to use ATP on carpet, but the accuracy is not as good as it is on hard surfaces. So Dane, why don't you tell, the, tell our audience a little bit about your experience with ATP meters? Because you and I first heard about them in the 90s from our friend Joe Arrigo. Yeah, and we've, heard, we've known this for a long time. I don't think a lot of us really understood exactly uh, what, we were, uh, what we were measuring. And uh, with the ATP meters that we're seeing out there, it, it rolls its way into the opportunity. You know, a lot of people look at their floors and say, oh, it looks clean to me. And uh, there's nothing here designed to hide any soils or things like that. And so the ATP meter is a way to get the client to understand that you may have more things there than you realize. And so that's part of the opportunity. Uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, you're measuring the luminescence of something that is biological. Uh, we don't know exactly what it is, but the, the swab that you take from it, uh, basically it's a luminometer because they give off a luminescence similar to what a firefly does and when it lights up is the same type of thing that's happening here. And so we can take a swab and we can measure, a, you know, by um, doing the swab on a hard surface beforehand and then seeing what that measurement is of what level of ATP you have. It tells you you've got some biological matter there. It doesn't tell you exactly what it is but then you can show them with a deep cleaning process how we can actually make that number go down. And I think that's really the key looking at that from an opportunity because now you can measure it and people love to see things that they can measure. And so I think it's a great way to explain to the client, um, here's a way that you can, you can measure this. They do this a lot in hospitals to determine if their cleaning program has actually uh, completed the tasks or removed the potential hazard from the area. And you can tell by this, we used to do this um, with people's cell phones. Uh, your cell phones are way more, have way more biological contamination on them than people realize. And we would do this at trade shows where we'd ask somebody's cell phone, we'd take a, a swipe with it, tell them how much uh, ATP was there. And then we would clean it with one of the disinfectant wipe or something like that. And then take another swab sample and measure it that way. And they could see it was sometimes 10 or 12 fold lower than what it was before. So they could really see there was a difference in using these particular type of products. So it's a good way to measure if you're gonna go in and tell somebody, hey, we're gonna go deep, we're gonna do a deep clean for you. Here's what, here's what you had before we started, here's what we have afterwards and we measured it this way. Uh, it's a great thing to have on a report or on an invoice that lets them know that we really accomplished something here. So ATP can be your friend. So uh, it, it doesn't, tell you, you, you can't, it, it's not, it's accuracy is not to the point that you can claim sanitization or disinfection, right, Dane? What it's That's really right. telling you is by numbers, how much you've improved. Is that pretty much how it works? Right. It, it just shows you what the bio load, if you will, was on the surface before you started and what the bio load is afterwards, because all living things have ATP in them and, and you're just measuring what that is. Okay, great. Hey, Mike, I know you're on mute, but I, you also have some experience with uh, 
using ATP measurements on hard surface. Do you, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've done hundreds and hundreds of demos with either auto scrubbers or Kyvac type machines where I've used ATP. I, I have two meters at my house. It's something that I've done for the last 10 years or so. Um, it, it, it is a great technology, uh, uh, as Dane said, to give you an idea of where you're starting. So in other words, you do a swab, and let's say it comes up with a number around 400. Uh, and then you go ahead and do your clean with whatever machine you're demoing, and you can get down to less than 100. It just, it's just proof that you, that you have much cleaner surface. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dane, but uh, when I was doing it back in the day, a chef's hands had to be less than 50 to touch your food. You remember hearing that? Uh, I don't. I didn't do a lot of work in food service, so I don't. I don't have that kind of data. Yeah. So, but in any case, it, it, it as Dane said, it's it's a very good way of showing. So it's hard to measure clean on a surface that looks clean. So this gives you an opportunity to do that. All right. Well, remind me later, guys, when we get to the marketing section. I, I would really like both your opinions on using ATP and marketing, especially in demonstrations. Uh, uh, Mike, since you've done a lot of it too, um, I, I'd really like to get your feedback because these these types of instruments aren't, uh, they sound a little, uh, you know, NASA-ish or beyond comprehension, but you can buy an ATP meter from John Don. They sell them on, on their website. So it's not like they're not available to the average person in our industry if you can afford the expense of the meter itself and then the swabs that, that you use to measure the surfaces. So we do have a way on hard surface, even more than carpet cleaning, I think to, to really give us some ideas on uh, how we can, how we've improved the healthfulness of the hard surface floors. I, I wanna bring our audience back for, uh, for a minute to specifically to the COVID-19 uh, virus and what we've learned over the past, what now amounts to almost three months. It's, it's it, one of the things that we do know is that the virus is inactivated by detergents. It has a lipid envelope that's not protective. Uh, Dr. Cole and the rest of the team at the Cleaning Industry Research Institute taught us that. And we know that heat is a good thing to use in the process too. So we know that the, the virus itself does respond. In other words, it, it works quite well, just the deep cleaning process. But anytime we're talking about cleaning, when we get done with the cleaning process, it always brings up the question of what else? Well, the first thing I'd like to tell you is that the research that, that we've done over this, these past three months, and really the research that Dane's been involved with, with me and Dr. Barry going back into the 90s, and Mike has been involved with uh, from the, Jan, the, the Jansan world. If you start with this idea that after the deep clean, what else is appropriate, then you're nine steps ahead of where so much that's going on right now. If the surface is deep clean, then applying a disinfectant as the next step is certainly an acceptable and reasonable process in most cases. I think what Dane and myself and Sean Bassayon and Bill Yaden and Jim Pemberton and Bill Wiegand and several of the others that have appeared in these webinars have talked about is that it's when you don't take any deep cleaning steps and you just start spraying and fogging disinfectants indiscriminately across all kinds of surfaces and give somebody the impression that the environment is now safe. That's just, we're all concerned about that. So when it comes to all these different after deep cleaning steps, uh, the, the answer is with some level of assurance, they couldn't hurt and many of them are likely helpful so long as you deep clean first. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time today talking about disinfection or applying disinfectants to hard surfaces because we're really focusing in on the first step today, which is deep cleaning. So Dane, we're ready to start talking about the cleaning process itself. Walk sure. us through this and, and 
kind of, uh, you know, let me know when you want to see the next slide and, and what you want to talk about. But I, I love this slide that you asked me to put up because it really talks about a, a systems approach to this whole process. So help us out here. Wonderful. Oh, thanks, Doc. Yeah, it, cleaning has always been a systems approach. You, you always need to be thinking about what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be doing it. Even though most of us live in the world of restorative clean, that doesn't mean that we can't take the time to understand what has to go on in the, in the buildings when we're not there. And so that's why, and, and this with apologies to Shaw, where I borrowed this little quadrant thing from, um, and I kind of adopted it for my own use here. This was basically talking about uh, luxury vinyl tile and luxury vinyl plank floors in a, a program I did for Surfaces East several years ago, and talking about the maintenance operations for people who sell the flooring, because once they sell it, it's out of their store and they don't really know about it or hear about it anywhere, anywhere else. And so I, I tell them, I said, well, this is, this is what happens to the flooring after you sell it. Um, nobody's allowed to walk on it with shoes in a residential situation for at least a week. You know, mom is making sure that nobody's walking on a new floor and nothing bad is happening to it. Uh, they're not taking a lot of preventative strategies other than removing shoes. And if the shoes are as contaminated as what Doyle said from the previous studies that we looked at about how much fecal material we're actually walking through and getting on our shoes, uh, the thing that really stuck out to me was they measured 421,000 colony forming units on the outside of the shoe compared with less than 3,000 colony forming units inside the interior of the shoe. So we know the contamination has come from the outside. So in a way, you know, Mrs. Smith is very right by saying, hey, we're not going to let you walk on this new floor with shoes on. Well, everything relaxes a little bit and somebody forgets and they come in and they wear their shoes sometimes. So now we know that 90, 90 to 99% of the whatever material they have in the shoe is now transferring to the floor. And they get to the point where they've got to go in and they've got to clean it now. And they've got to do a routine service to remove the soils that have built up, whether that's removing dry or wet or sticky debris, whatever they happen to have. And that's done in a routine situation. Uh, mopping typically is a, is a routine cleaning solution. Uh, a routine cleaning service. Auto scrubbing in a lot of large commercial buildings is going to be a routine cleaning service. I've done millions of square feet of cleaning with auto scrubbers back in my janitorial service days. And, and I love the fact that we can clean a large area of the floor, but where we're really getting the bio load off of that particular material, uh, thinking about the different detergents that we will be looking at. And so moving into the idea of an interim or periodic procedure was always intriguing to me because it was in between the routine and the restorative, where in my carpet cleaning hat, I wore that and I was going to clean residential floors, it was always restorative. And because I had a fire breathing truck mount outside, I knew that I could clean whatever was presented to me. Whereas there was an opportunity though to remove lesser amounts of soil at a more frequent interval by using an interim or periodic procedure. Um, this is where you'd see in carpet cleaning, you'd see your low moisture cleans, your encapsulation processes and things like that to rack up larger amounts of square footage with lesser amounts of soil so you could produce a faster result, which is what a lot of contractors want because time is going to equal into money. So you might have to use some different tools and equipment. Uh, when we get into talking about the different types of floors that we deal with, we end up talking about, you know, floors that have uh, subsurface grooves or, or uh, access points where we have to go down below the surface to try to remove something. Well, you know, in the, in the stone world, that means we have to create wicking. We have to get that whatever is soaked into the pore structure or the capillaries of that material. We've got to get it out a rise of the surface where we can access it. And so that may become an interim or, or procedure. We may have to allow more dwell time. Think of cleaning a floor in a, uh, a kitchen of a restaurant where we know that we've got greases and oils and animal fats that are penetrating in to that quarry tile and that grouted surface with that pore structure that they have. And we've got to, we've got to send our detergent down in there to get that. So we're activating longer dwell times and allowing that detergent to do the job of, of going deeper into the floor to be able to pull that back and make that happen. Uh, maybe additional cleaning times to accomplish the task. Uh, rather than just do a quick mop uh, and removal, um, I go back to my initial foray into the cleaning world when I was 15 years old. I got hired by a grocery store uh, that brought me in to clean the meat department. 
and we learned the difference between wet mopping with dwell time and damp mopping, which was more of a speed process. And because we were kids and because we were looking to do it the fastest, easiest way, we would damp mop floors, but we weren't removing all the debris. Well, in a meat cutting facility, you've got people with extremely sharp knives. And if they fall with a knife in their hand, someone next to them might get injured. And that's what actually happened uh, to me when I was about 15 and a half years old. And I was sat down in front of the manager and said, were you wet mopping or damp mopping? And I said, we were damp mopping. He said, you're the only one that was honest. You get to keep your job. Uh, because a, a meat cutter was severely injured by someone falling backwards and cutting them with a knife on a slippery floor that was our responsibility to take care of. So these procedures go way back in my history, well before I had my own cleaning company, uh, but that was my first foray in that. Could you switch to the next slide, Bill? So other things in different types of floors could be, um, you know, my favorite thing in the whole world was deep scrub and recoat. Uh, people call it top scrubbing, people will call it a lot of other things, but to not take all the finish off the floor uh, and strip a floor, which was the thing I hated to do as a, uh, a restoration service, but many of my early contracts would state to me that I would have to resurface, uh, you know, strip and wax the floor on a quarterly basis, which basically was every, nine, every 90 days. Well, the attitude of myself and my crew on day 89 of that floor was, well, you know, we're not going to get really excited about the floor today because tomorrow it's coming out. And, and that, that day 89 would switch to day 87 and day 86, and pretty soon it became day 10. And we didn't give the floor enough of a thought process to say, look, we've got some other tools we can use for this. And I remember the day that I learned it was February 27th, 1987. And I went to a seminar that was by the Butcher's Floor Finish Company. And they talked about top scrub and recoat. And when we brought it back to the company and we started using that tool, which looked to the customer like we had actually done a complete strip and refinish. But all we did was take off the soiled layers of the finish and then reapply new finish on top of that. And the floor looked amazing. And we were able to save time and effort by using an interim procedure here. And so that was the way we did it a lot of times with auto scrubbers because we had such large acreage uh, to be able to deal with. If you could flip the next slide, Bill. Well, Dane, Dane, I wanted to jump in here for a second. So I, I think to kind of what we're reiterating the, uh, to the audience is just like in carpet cleaning where low moisture systems and absorbent compound systems and interim systems have their place. When we talk about mopping for, you know, professional mopping, we'll say, and we talk about uh, auto scrubbers and the different types of, of industrial machines that are out there, they have a place in this process because it's the, most of these hard surface floors do have to clean, be clean in, in a lot of places every night, correct? Every night. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, because you, don't, you don't want it to go too far. You don't want it to get too far away from you by not doing it every night and then making sure that everybody understands what I always tried to get into to the people that worked for me and, that, and even into my customers was, we're not going to be soil centric. We're not going to focus on the soil levels. We're going to focus on the schedule that we know works. And that would alter sometimes seasonally. Sometimes, you know, in the summertime when we didn't have a grit and debris, we didn't have snow and ice melt or compound and other things coming into the building, we could get by with lesser uh, procedures than we could in the winter time where we had a lot of debris coming into the building. So we would look at things and determine based on a schedule that we knew to be workable in this environment that we would be schedule centric. So no matter what the floor would look like, we would provide and do this, uh, the specific procedures, the schedule called for, whether it appeared the floor needed those things or not. And so that was, that became the basis of a lot of things that I teach in the classes that I do is, don't focus on the soil because a lot of times you're not really seeing where it is. Like an example would be the picture you're seeing up here. This is a manufacturing facility in a lunchroom area where for the most part, because of the people who were eating in the lunchroom of factory workers, they didn't look around and go, oh, hey, this floor is dirty. But when you look along that edge, you can tell that this floor has some soil concerns that are not gonna be cleaned routinely anymore. You're gonna have to go to a deeper level to get those edges done. If you flip to the next photo, you kind of get an idea for the, you know, where this is located. And so they're mopping this floor on a regular basis. Well, where has that mop been? You know, if that mop has been, and we'll see in the next couple of pictures, if that mop has been in a place where 
you shouldn't cross contaminate. This is a mop from an airport restroom. Uh, if you take it, just take a look at that bucket for a second. You've got an, a heavily soiled mop bucket with clean solution inside of it, which is getting soil from the inside of the bucket and contaminating that already. Where's that soil come from? Does it come from a restroom area? That should never be transferred into another area. And I think that's why you see a lot of cross contamination happening is because the mop has no idea of where to absorb the soil from. It just does its job. It just absorbs wherever it can. Whether that be in the bucket or on the floor, it doesn't matter to the mop. So the technician who's operating that mop has to be the brains of the outfit and has to say, if I'm putting bathroom type soils in my mop bucket, that water can't go anyplace else. And it's the reason why auto scrubbers were so, are so popular for working in a routine facility because they don't reuse the water. Anytime we're gonna reuse the water, we're taking the risk of cross-contamination. So if the next slide, this was, I was uh, walking through a similar airport and, and I noticed that what they had done here, they'd done a couple of things. And this is technician level uh, wizardry, if you will. Um, you've got an extremely heavily soiled mop ringer in the front cart that you see there, but they put a rag underneath it to filter the water that's ringing out of the dirty ringer and the dirty mop before it went into the uh, sectioned off area where the rinse water was supposed to go. And then the cleaner water is in the front of that bucket. Well, it's better until you realize that they had cleaned that day, because I asked them as I was walking past them in the airport, they had already cleaned 19 restrooms with that same water. So, Where's this going? Now, if it's only restroom cleaning, you're still bringing people with their shoes in there. Um, and then from there, we're going to go onto the airplane. And I've seen people literally walk barefoot into an airplane restroom, knowing where what's been on that plane from just whatever people's shoes have walked down that aisle and putting that directly on their bodies for whatever reason, which I cannot fathom why they would do that if you flip the slide. So we start talking about things. I'm sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah, they, so we're talking about that there's an opportunity here for professional carpet cleaners, professional restoration contractors to go in and augment facility maintenance people with deep cleaning. That, that you know, that, and I think that we'll, that we'll talk about that more when we get to marketing but we talked about that in, in the webinar I did with John Braun on that many, the, the, a lot of the big opportunity for deep cleaning hard surface floors is not to displace the daily maintenance workers. It's to come in periodically and deep clean all the surfaces so that their interim and periodic uh, steps work better to keep the facility healthier. Is, is that the sure. general idea that we're shooting at here? Absolutely, because here's, here's, what I'm gonna, here's what I've noticed about commercial buildings, right? When you walk into any commercial building anywhere in the world, I think, if they're doing a strip and wax program, it is dialed in. They've got it down to a science. They know exactly what they're doing. Uh, they know how to do it. They know how to make sure that they're getting the, the best amount of shine in there. But when you go into another area of that building where they've got a three-dimensional floor, let's say they've got some luxury vinyl plank or tile, they've got some uh, tile and grout, for example, or even in a lot of cases, their carpet, you have that third dimension of depth. All the tools they have in their janitor closet are flat, and now the floor isn't. And so the tools aren't working as well in those situations because they're not designed to clean a floor that has you know, a, a, a grout valley every 13 to 15 inches. Uh, they're not designed to go into the grooves of the luxury vinyl product, and they don't know how to react to that because they've got all the tools they need to make their flat floors look perfect, but they can't do anything you know, beyond that. And so, yeah, for us to go in in an interim basis uh, in between their routine cleaning that they're normally doing, and then before they get into the deep cleaning stuff, we can. there's a great opportunity there, especially if you show them uh, you know, with an ATP meter how much debris bio load is actually on that floor but it all comes down to a good thorough pre-inspection also well that um, our old friend doug bowles used to teach his upholstery class and he'd always begin it with the with the idea there's two reasons that you want to get educated here one is to make money and two is to stay out of trouble and i think that's a that's a really good segue to talking about 
this is where pre-inspection comes in, is okay, now that we have said that there's an opportunity to clean residential and commercial, deep clean residential and commercial floors, people have a tendency to get nervous because they're not familiar at, or as familiar with a lot of these surfaces. So help us out. What are the proper steps to pre-inspect the hard surface floor? Well, the first thing I want you to think about, and this was our, our friend Barry Costa told me this on a class I took from him many years ago, who said, whatever you tell the customer before you take their cash is a professional opinion. Whatever you tell them after you've taken their cash in their eyes is an excuse that for poor workmanship because it didn't come out the way they wanted to. So the pre-inspection is before cash is exchanged. That's where I want to spend the majority of my time. I want to find every possible thing that could, that could go wrong for me. I, I want to find every possible thing to show them, here's a snapshot of your material right before you start. Yeah, this is a tile and grout pre-inspection form that I uh, made available here. But you could adapt this very easily. It's just a Word document to, to work for other pre-inspection of floors in the, in, the same, in the same vein. So that you mark everything that you find. And what I'm talking about is on your hands and knees with a magnifying glass or better yet a microscope to find all of the potential issues here. Them seeing you look that thoroughly means that you know what you're looking for and you know what you're doing. You know, it's, it's, those, it's the detail stuff that impresses the client that you found. The detail stuff that says, hey, there's a crack in your grout joint over here. Uh, you've got an overlap seam over here. You've got uh, some other issues that, that we can't fix it. Because at the end of the day, what you've got to realize is your cleaning tool can only do one thing, and that's remove soil. You, you can't solve all the multitude of problems you're going to run into if they're installation or manufacturing related. It, it just isn't going to happen or lack of maintenance related some, sometimes also, where now you've got scratches or scuffs or other things that are happening that you can't fix with that. You flip over one more slide going. So you wanna evaluate the floor by looking extremely carefully at those things. And I don't walk, I crawl. I get on my hands and knees and I crawl. Of course, I put gloves on because we know what's on the floors now. Uh, knee pads in case you've got old knees like I do that you can't get on the floor as easily as you used to but I want a successful outcome. The more detail-minded I am with the client, the more confidence they're gonna have in my abilities to make this happen. We gotta recognize what's gonna hurt us. Like, like Doug said, you know, I don't wanna get in trouble here, Doug Bowles, I don't wanna get in trouble, so I wanna find these things that are gonna become problems for me. Point out repairs or corrections that might need to be made. Um, I tell people, check the corner round along the edge of your ceramic tile kitchen to make sure you're not gonna get any moisture underneath that if it's not flat to the floor, that needs to be caulked. You know, and, and so that you're not gonna allow moisture to get behind the wood in places like that. Make sure the scope of work actually reflects and accurately reflects exactly what you're gonna be doing and then what you cannot perform for them. You know, and think about it, if carpets are being cleaned on average every five years by professionals, and again, I know that's a wide range as many of you have customers because you help them understand why it's better to come in more often. But hard surface floors are decades sometimes before a professional sees them. And so we just got to make sure that we understand that. So make sure that you're actually reflecting what the price and what the value for that price is, why it's going to be the price that it is. You know, it's not it's going to be different than carpet and those kinds of things. You'd uh, flip over Mr. Gloss. All right, so we, now you're going to talk about the specific steps in this pre-inspection. And obviously, the first thing is gaining an understanding of what the different types of floors that they're going to encounter are, are out there. And don't you think, I, I mean, I was, I was just Googling the other day the differences between luxury vinyl plank and luxury vinyl tile, the differences between laminate and luxury vinyl plank and luxury vinyl tile. And all over and over and over again, every time you, you're reading about this, they always talk about how these floors are designed to look like either tile, stone, or wood floors. So the, the, our, our ability to just walk into a, into a building or a home and immediately know that that's a tile floor or a stone floor, or that's concrete, it's not as easy as, as it may have once been because there's a whole lot of flooring materials out there trying to look like other flooring materials, correct? 
Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, you mentioned laminate, and, and I do talk about this in my floor care technician class. We, we put laminate in the wood category because it has a really good picture of wood on it, but it's plastic and medium density fiberboard uh, is all it is. That's as close as it gets to wood. And so it cannot take even casual contact with water without having some type of swelling issue and things like that. So recognizing it visually is you may not get there. And that's why you have to go through this process on your hands and knees determining what this particular flooring material might be. Um, and not only that, but let's, let's even focus on just one aspect of it. Let's focus on a grouted surface, for example. You know, you mentioned luxury vinyl tile, luxury vinyl plank. Most of the plank is designed to look like hardwood. And from a distance, it really does until you get close enough to realize you're looking for patterns. You're going to see the same board in the, in, in multiple times throughout that installation. And, and so that's one of the ways you can tell visually if you see a pattern, if it's man produced. Natural wood is not going to have the same grain pattern in any of the boards. They're all going to be different. And, and so we, we need to understand they're all going to be, uh, you know, have be uh, more porous or, or more dense compared as to where they were in the tree when the tree was growing? Are they part of the heartwood, which is gonna be very dense, or are they part of the sapwood, which is way more porous? And so you're gonna have different amounts of stain that they're able to take in, and you're gonna have light and dark. So you're looking for those visual characteristics that tell us, here's what it might be. And if it's man-made or man-produced, your risk factor starts to climb down, but, you know, of doing the wrong thing on it. If it's natural, you're gonna see randomness to the entire installation. It's not gonna look, there's gonna be no two things that look exactly alike. And so that's the big thing you're looking for. Um, but you gotta also take into consideration the grout, right? In the SMT class that I do, I, I tell people early in the process, grout is a one-off in every home or building that you're in. It was mixed with the water from that location and it was mixed by the tile setter's helper with probably too much water. And if you put too much water in that concrete mix, what ends up happening is you end up with big pores. You end up with a deep valley because even though it was installed even with the tiles, it shrunk because the water bled out or evaporated from it, leaving behind large pores. So every grout line you encounter is not going to be the same as the one you just saw last week or yesterday. It's going to be different. It's going to, and we're going to put pressures on there that might, the grout may not last very well in that space. So I'm looking for, is it clay-based, man-made? Is it uh, earth-driven uh, coming from a natural stone quarry? Uh, you're gonna see a more random pattern on the floor visually. Then if you flip the slide over, you can look in, and see and communicate that with the client to let them know, here's what we found. Many of the clients that we deal with don't know what they have. Uh, they bought the house and the, and the product was in there. They moved into the building and the product was already on the floor. So they're not sure exactly what it is. It's nice if you can tell them what it is. Um, and if you don't know what it is, there's some other opportunities. If you flip the slide over uh, in your pre-inspection, you can tell one by the appearance. Remember, you're looking for random versus non-random patterns, right? And then you want to check the porosity level. If it's a floor that will take on moisture, right? So you just put a drop of moisture on there and see how that moisture behaves. If it does go in to the material, if it does, you know, go, you'll see the material darken around it. Or like in the case of uh, Satillo, which is a Mexican clay tile made by hand, you'll actually watch the water disappear into the tile. Well, that means when you put your cleaning product on there, the same things are going to happen, right? And so we want to be aware of not only is it going to sink in and, and perhaps uh, go beyond where I can access it to pull it off, um, how much if I'm going to seal those materials by putting in a penetrating sealer product, the porosity level is going to tell me how much sealer I might need. In Satio, you're going to need gallons and gallons of penetrating sealer to stop uh, and clog that pore from anything else, other liquids getting in there. So I'm checking the porosity. It's going to tell me what it is. And I'm also going to check to see if I can use uh, different types of cleaning agents on it. You know, can I use uh, an alkaline treatment to remove my protein soils, but if I've got some mineral-based soils that are stuck in the openings of those big pores, do I need to use an acidic cleaner to actually take off a layer of that cement-based grout to release those soils and cut them into a slurry where I can actually extract them off the floor? 
where you want to be careful with that is around anything that is calcium based. So your marble products, your limestone products, your travertine products are all going to be in the limestone basin. So the acid sensitivity test, you want to see the foaming action on the, on the grout. You don't want to see it on the tile. That's the kind of thing that we're looking for in our pre-inspection. Basically, are there, are there times I, when the acid test can trick you? I mean, does every stone floor respond to acid? Do the bubbling? No, no, only the calcium based stones. Okay. So only the ones I talked about, marble, limestone, and travertine. The granites, the slates, and some of the others that are non calcium based, you won't see that fizzing action. The only time that I've seen where you get a false positive is where you've got some grout haze on the surface of the tile. And as, it's, as the acid comes in contact with that calcium, it'll flash white and then it'll clear almost immediately before your eyes. That tells you that you have grout haze on the floor and you've got to remove that before you can start doing other services on there. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we might do is we might do a, a hardness or an abrasion resistance exam, if you will, to find out how is the product going to behave if I put it under a lot of pressure. For example, I've seen a lot of grout brushes that are out there. One of them now is made of stainless steel. That's fine if you've got something that is harder than stainless steel around the grout, like granite. If you've got something softer than stainless steel, like marble, limestone, travertine, or slate, you're going to scratch those using that, that particular grout cleaning brush. Even a, a heavy-duty nylon brush will scratch something as soft as slate. So you want to be cautious with that. So I want to know where does this fall on in my abrasion resistance? Especially if they're asking me as a tool, which we're gonna see in the next several slides, if they want me to recreate a shine on that surface, I've gotta be able to, to know how to do that with some of the different abrasive products that we have available to us. And then what's the finish type on the material? Is it polished to a reflective shine, like you can do with a lot of calcium-based stones and also the silicate like granite? Um, or is it left in a non-reflective uh, but smooth state called home. You know, I want to understand that. And there's several different finishes, flame cut and patinated antique. There's a lot of different things for natural stone that they can do with that particular product. And you, you and I talked about this last week when we were chatting about this. Just in, in watching in interactive uh, social media, the questions that come up about hard surface floors, it seems to me that the pro, a proliferation of difficulties is caused by cleaners that start to work on a floor that didn't identify that it had an improper finish put on it. Is, is that what you experience in your classes, that, that people, that what started out to be a routine deep cleaning job with their rotary hard surface tool turns into a nightmare because they didn't identify a finish? Yeah, nightmare is a kind word for that. No, I, I actually take a pledge in my class where I pledge that I will never put a form filming finish on top of any floor that has grout on it because somebody's going to have to remove that. And what it ends up happening is, and you see this a lot with um, custodial staff, which is used to stripping and finishing floors. They, they want to put a finish over the top of a ceramic tile or a travertine or whatever it is, but because of the smoothness of the material coming from the quarry, it doesn't have any bond characteristics. And because you don't have any bonding characteristics, it basically walks off the floor rather quickly. So they go to a more permanent finish, like an epoxy or a urethane product, which you need a special stripping agent to get that off. So what I tell people in the pre-inspection is, Look for a shiny grout line. If you've got a shine or reflection in the grout line, you've got a coating on that floor that you may or may not be able to remove. So what I try and explain to my students is, look, if you didn't put the coating on, don't volunteer to take it off, even if they're going to pay you. Because I have never heard a happy story in over 700 SMT classes that I've done. I've never heard a happy story. And so if you just stay away from that, you won't run into problems. Just tell them politely, Ask the people who put the coating on to come back and take it off for you. And these can be simple coatings like mop and glow. Mop and glow is an acrylic. You need an acrylic stripper to take it off. Most floor finish strippers will not take off acrylic finishes. So the stuff you buy at your janitorial store is not going to take off an acrylic. Uh, the stuff you buy at the grocery store like future floor finish is an acrylic finish designed for the housewife to keep on her actual linoleum floor from back in the day. 
um, and then keep it shiny and it doesn't wear off rather quickly. And that's the kind of stuff that you're not going to be able to get it off. Um, you'll get it off on 90% of the floor, but that other 10% isn't going to come off. And then you're going to see the difference of where that is. And so that's why I take that pledge and I tell people that I won't do that to them. Because All right, I wanted to let our listeners know, and also anybody who's watching the video on this in the coming days and weeks, um, part, one of the downloads that we will have for you is detailed. It details these seven steps of the pre-inspection. I've asked poor Dane to try and cover it in about 10 minutes here, and it's really the most important part of the day, I think. So that's why we spend as much time as we did. But we do have step-by-step -step detailed directions on the pre-inspection process that will be available to you, just as we have detailed procedures on, the, on deep cleaning for each surface. But this next section, I think, is, is what I consider to be the most important thing that I ever learned from you, Dane. I think you were the original one who gave me this, this idea of where do you draw the line? So let's, let's talk about that, because you can't obviously in a webinar in 90 minutes teach everybody how to, to clean all these surfaces and, and then beyond cleaning. So let's, let's help them understand where to draw the line. What is cleaning? and what is a step beyond cleaning. So let's start with tile and grout. Okay. What do you consider to be something that most cleaners are capable of doing with a little bit of education and some knowledge? And what requires, you know, you need to get some specialty training? Well, yeah, I, I think that, you know, any of the deep restorative cleaning, because we've got all the tools available to us with the you know, the, the spinning type uh, turbo style tools that we have available to us for cleaning the tile and grout, I think work very well. Just make sure you check your grout that it can take the pressure you're going to use under the tool. And I think that along with um, the sealer portion of it, I think that um, I'm comfortable with, with somebody walking into a distribution location and getting some quick, here's how you do it type things. And I think they're fine there. Where I think you need to draw the line and get some additional training would be uh, grout repairs and grout restoration. Um, I think that I would I would certainly do that. It's hard matching color on location if you don't have any of the additional grout available to you. And if you do decide to do it, I'll give you one quick little tip. Make sure that you match the color dry, not wet. Uh, it'll be because it'll dry different and you're not going to look good there. And any grout coloring, I would also recommend get additional training for that. Um, there's good schools out there to, you know, let people happen. I know there's, you know, many different grout colorant companies out there uh, that would do that. But any type of repair, I mean, you see what you've got the saw down there. That's a vibrating saw because you don't want to use a cutting tool. Uh, they can actually crack tile if you're not, not sure how to use them. So you want to get some training. And what I tell people all the time is never learn this stuff in your customer's locations, right? Have some setup in your shop where you can practice on it and get comfortable with it for yourself. If you're walking into a job site and, and, and you see something that you've never done before and you don't know how to do it, I would say, I would walk away and just tell the client, I'm not, I'm not, I'm that, not sure that's what I was going to say. It's okay to walk away, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and, and say, I, I, you know, the, I'm not the right person to do this. If you walk in and you, you find a lot of loose grout or you find grout that's in, in terrible shape. It's okay to just say this isn't this isn't what our company is capable of doing. It's okay to refer them to a, an expert. Sure. Yeah. Flip to the next slide. We'll, we'll even get it. We'll yeah. Get it all right. That that leads us to stone, which is even more so. Right. I mean, you know, there's some softer abrasives, some more flexible abrasives out there that I think are much easier for us to work with and understand. The Zoom pads, the Spinergy pads, the Monkey pads. You know, those kinds of products. But when you get into diamond discs, unless you've done it before and the client's asking you to do it, lipage removal is probably the hardest thing to learn. They, it's, it's a master and apprentice level type understanding. Uh, stone masons have been doing this for centuries and understanding how to make that happen. It's not something you can come to a two-day class and learn. You've got to go to specialized schools for that. And so that's where I would kind of draw that line of, we're good at removing the soil and cleaning it, and then we can protect it, just like we do with carpet. That's, very, that's a, a fairly, I don't want to say simplistic, but it's much easier for us to digest that because we do it in other areas. 
when we get into transforming things, uh, taking scratches out and doing those kinds of things, that's where you want to make sure you've got some additional training levels. And there's a lot of good schools to go to for that. Um, and, and I think I can get you a list though, if you want to send that out to folks, I can make sure. All right. that. But once again, it's okay to walk away. If, if, Absolutely. if there's, if this is beyond your capability, then you do that. And, and we're not, we're, we're talking about sometimes you're doing them a favor by going ahead and deep cleaning it, but pointing out to them things like lippage that do need to be dealt with at some point, because it, it does present uh, a, a hazard to, to the people using the floor. Okay, what about concrete? You know, concrete is, they've been polishing this for a long time. Concrete's going to behave exactly like a grout line would behave. You've got the same componentry there. So just think of it as a really wide grout line. But now we can transform it by using some of the softer abrasives. Uh, you can get into the deep abrasives. But you start looking at the concrete products and machines that are available out there. There's, you know, 20, 30, 50 $200,000 machines to deal with concrete. Um, if you don't have one of those, I would clean it and I would call it a day. I don't know that I'd want to get too deep into it unless I've gone to special schools and understand, you know, densifiers. Are they lithium silicate, potassium silicates? You know, what are we dealing with there? What do densifiers actually do? Um, you know, how's that process work? That, that's specialty stuff that you're going to want to know if you decide to get in. Now, concrete work is very lucrative. Um, especially adding coatings and colors and swirls and, you know, there, there's some beautiful things that are happening with it. But again, if you're not fully prepared to deal with the questions your customer is going to be giving to you, you want to get yourself some, some information and some education on it so that you are um, basically understanding, like Doug Bull said, let's not get into trouble here by out, outperforming our knowledge. I think it was, uh, a good friend, of the late Mr. Bob Bonwell, said you can't outperform your knowledge. Yes, it was. So, so be aware of that, that, uh, you know, don't be afraid to say, I'm sorry, I'm not equipped. I'm not ready to do something like this yet, rather than get yourself in trouble. Or, or what I've also seen is people going on some of the bulletin boards and some of the other places asking for advice on how to do it. A lot of that advice is good, but a lot of that advice isn't, and it's not vetted by anybody. So if, uh, just just be cautious out there. Get information from reputable sources so that you're not participating in the downfall of someone else's flooring. Well, and you know, in this day and age, Aramsco, John Don, the NSN network, all three of them have really good, excellent concrete grinding programs available. If it's something you're interested in, polishing and densifying and grinding, it's your normal suppliers. It's not like you're going to have to go to some special place to get trained, but they, but it is a completely different animal and make sure that you understand that. Yes. Yeah. All right. Just, Let, we're going to talk for just a quick second about, we've talked about luxury vinyl plank today. And, and I, one of the things that I know that most of our listeners, whether they're listening in today or watching this video their first thought when you and I talk to them about deep cleaning some of these floors is that, that my, my customer doesn't ask me about it because she thinks or they think in a commercial setting that they're keeping it clean. Well, and that certainly plays in with, with luxury vinyl plank. I mean, if you buy luxury vinyl plank, which we just did, we're building a new house, my wife and I, and we put a lot of plank in there. And when the salesperson was talking to us about it, you'd think that it was completely maintenance free, that you run across it with your, your Swiffer and you are good to go, you know? And, and it's funny because you mentioned all those finishes that end up getting put on these floors because they don't stay as shiny as the, the people who bought them thought they were. But we know that from one of, the, from one of our partners, uh, Jim, Man, Jim Manis at Shaw Industries, um, coming up in, uh, in September at the experience, we're going to be continuing some studies that have been done on different ways to clean luxury vinyl plank because what they're finding out is that the grooves aren't so groovy when it comes to getting them clean, that the soil is embedding in these grooves and it's not coming out. So there are a couple of different ways that Jim is looking at some potential deep cleaning methods that go beyond their traditional cleaning. 
And I know that you were involved with one of them. Uh, they used a CRB machine with an absorbent compound. Share with our audience a little bit about that. Yeah, we, we actually went down to their laboratory uh, in Dalton, Georgia, because we were told by them that they were struggling, especially with construction cleanup, because the sheetrock dust was getting down into those grooves, and, and they were mopping it and trying to scrub it with traditional tools, and it was going deeper and deeper into the, into the grooves and, and into the uh, wood grain look material. And so we went there with our CRB, which has bristle tips that were allowed to get into that space because they're a real type brush. Uh, rather than a rotary type brush and then using the absorbent compound so we didn't re-wet the area we were able to get them clean to the point where uh, as one of Sean's recommended methods for construction clean is to use the CRB machine along with the absorbent compound. So right so now that is a recommended method. That is, is that a recommended right? Okay all right yeah. I want to make sure everybody understands that. The, the second part of this is that they are looking at testing with hard surface cleaning wands both rotary and stationary, um, uh, not only the effect obviously on the material of the floor, but also the adhesive. But the other concern obviously is that if moisture gets down underneath the floor, that there's going to be mold. And so one of the things that they're doing is they're in the process of sending us some of this new luxury vinyl plank to test uh, for them. We're gonna cl deep clean it and we're gonna send it back to them and let them evaluate it. And then also they're gonna be doing some of that testing live at the experience in Las Vegas. So it's an opportunity, we wanted to bring this up today so that those in our audience would know this is a potential future opportunity because by, by the definition of the owners themselves of this luxury vinyl plank, it's not coming as clean as they'd like it to because of the soil and the grooves. So there's a possibility that in the future, there, there, well, there's already a possibility with the CRB machine of the, and the absorbent compound to offer this as an additional service. So I wanted to bring it up today because it is growing so fast. Well, Dane, I really appreciate the time that you've taken to teach us a little bit about the pre-cleaning process, about where, you know, where that line is to be drawn. We're not going to have time today to go into deep cleaning procedures for every type of floor. But what I did want all of our attendees to know is that you will be sent the PowerPoint that has this, and you'll be able to download this step-by-step -step procedure for cleaning tile and grout, for cleaning natural stone. Uh, and this is basically following the guidelines that, that Dane has laid out here and some of the things to look for. It talks about some problems um, like efflorescence and, and things like that and what to do about situations like that. And then there's, a, there's basically a page where it says, if you encounter this, run away. It, it, it's just be, you know, to be able to walk away. So you'll have access to all those step-by-step -step procedures. But for those of you who are uh, listening in, understand that we, what we really are talking about here is deep cleaning processes, utilizing your truck mount, and either a rotary uh, wand or a stationary wand, uh, like a gecko wand, or even some of the hard surface wands that are more like a, typically like a carpet cleaning scrub wand. But obviously, Dane, you and I have been doing this long enough that we know that one of the big obstacles to this is that people who own hard surface floors generally don't reach a point like they do with carpet where they say, I have to get this deep cleaned by a professional. If the dog or the cat pees on the carpet enough time, if the kids spill Kool-Aid on the carpet enough times, if the soil tracking coming out of the garage or out of the kitchen is done enough, people reach a point both residentially and commercially where they say, I have to get the carpet deep clean. That's not necessarily the case with hard surface floors. So we wanted to close today by talking for just a few minutes about how to go about marketing deep cleaning services to your, to your customers, whether they be residential or commercial. 
And there are terms that we can use beyond the word clean. Since they think their forest floor is clean, restore, rejuvenate, revitalize are all good buzzwords that can get their attention that, that you can do something. And there have been four primary marketing messages that we've been preaching over this, this series of webinars about how to market deep cleaning during, from, as we emerge from COVID-19. Credibility, cleaning for health, safety and security, and increased frequency. So let's talk about this for a quick minute. When we talk about marketing, there's all kinds of ways to define marketing. I like to do it quickly by saying, from my, in my world, there's three functions to a marketing program. There's the marketing message, that's the information that you wanna to get to the customer. There's the marketing delivery system, that's how you get the information to the customer. And then there's the desired outcome or the customer response, which is what are you wanting the customer to do from this advertising? Now, when we talk about that, it, it seems kind of obvious if I were to say, what's the goal of your marketing or advertising, your immediate response would be, well, to get them to hire me to clean the floors. But what you have to understand is that most marketing is about getting permission to do more marketing because buying a your service is a function of timing. Did you get the message to them at the right time when they recognize this? So understand that a lot, one of the desired outcomes of most marketing campaigns is to keep your name in front of them, keep the services that you offer in front of them and get permission to do more marketing so that you can be there at the right time. And our good friend, John Braun, taught us a couple of weeks, several weeks ago about how to approach commercial clients. And one of the things that, that, that he talked about is simply targeting buildings that you know would have these floors that you wanna go after by Googling a, 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 a type of business and then calling them and asking them who is in charge of hiring a cleaning company or who is in charge of facility maintenance. So we don't really have time to go through that today, but if you wanna hear John's step-by-step -step process and how to accomplish this, it, what he talked about with commercial carpet cleaning certainly applies to hard surface floors. <clears throat> but I think the best way to approach understanding marketing the deep cleaning of floors is to make the unobvious obvious. And you do that by demonstrating. Demo, demo, demo. Anytime you're in a home or business doing any clean, cleaning service, it would serve you well to do a demonstration. One of the reasons is because they don't see how hard, how, how dirty their hard surface floor is. When you get the night and day effect that you see in these pictures, it wasn't that obvious to begin with, especially if they regularly mop or auto scrub that floor. And I know that many listeners listening in today, the idea of doing a quick free demo flies in the face of what some of you have been taught about never giving away your service, that if you give away your service, it cheapens it. But what I would challenge you to think about is if you and I know that their hard surface floor needs deep cleaned, but they don't, all the education and marketing in the world isn't as effective as going in and cleaning a small area and showing them what you can do for their floors. So there's several things you can do. One thing is if, most of you have on the side of your truck that you do hard surface cleaning, that you do clean the floors we've talked about today. Certainly most of you have it on your website that you do it. But one thing is, do you have a brochure that specifically addresses that you do deep cleaning of hard surface floors and gives them some tips for how to take care of that surface themselves? This is an example of a, a sales brochure that John Braun has available on his website that does that. 
So that may be something that you want to consider to start out. If you want to make deep cleaning a bigger priority in your cleaning business, then obviously you need to make it a bigger priority in your marketing assets. So that's what we wanted to do, try and do today is to help you out with that. We have a brand new marketing campaign that we're introducing today for the first time on hard surface floors. And we will send you the link to download it. But if you just can't wait, you can go there as soon as this webinar is open. It's hydromaster.com backslash hard floors. Let me show you some of the ads that are there. We've put together a series of sell sheets, ads, handouts for residential and commercial to help you make the message of deep cleaning more prominent in your business. Now, let me tell you something about these sell sheets or handouts. Not only can you download them as an example, you can download the original InDesign files. You'll have to do that through a Google program, but if you take these to a graphic artist that you work with, they can take these brochures and customize them to your specific business. For instance, instead of the truck that we have in there, you can put one of your trucks. If you're not an IICRC certified firm, you can take that logo off and put any other logo on there that you want. But as you will see in these, these brochures, we are selling this concept of deep cleaning. Our deep cleaning and extraction process can remove bacteria, soil, and as Dr. Barry defined it, other unwanted substances. They go into talking about what is deep cleaning, our unique high temp, high flow extraction process removes bacteria, soil, fecal matter, and other substances from your floors. So here's a, an example of the same flyer that you can make two different ways. One, you can hand it out while you're cleaning their, give them a copy of this while you're cleaning their carpets or their upholstery and say, hey, while we're here, can we do a free demonstration for you? Or use it to sell from the beginning that you wanna, you know, you're offering this service, you're not at their house right now, so you can make it that way. We've done the same thing commercially. Think your floors are spotless? Look closer. Studies show that hard surface floors can harbor bacterial contaminants, tracked fecal matter, and other unwanted substances that your mop or auto scrubber cannot eliminate or remove. So we talk about that in terms of selling what your capabilities are. Once again, you can make it so ask for a free demonstration while we're here, if you're already at that commercial business doing other types of cleaning, or you can use it from the scratch beginning as a sales brochure. Then we also put together a new series of ads specifically designed for social media and for your email newsletter, specifically touching on the points that we've talked about today. Bacteria does not leave footprints. Studies show that we touch contaminated floors as many as 50 times a day. Obviously, when you start thinking of toddlers and no shoes and running around on these floors, we're selling this message of deep cleaning for health. We're also continuing the message of restoring confidence. Come next year, you may want to take that off when COVID-19 hopefully is in our rear view mirror. A year from now, we're back to just selling the whole concept of cleaning for health, not just for appearance improvement. So once again, here's another one designed for the residential setting. Show, shows, studies show that bacteria can live on your clean floors. We can take care of that. Then we give you some that are specifically designed for each segment of the commercial marketplace. You may not be going after all these segments, that's okay, but going after restaurants and food preparation areas. You can talk about the typical terrazzo floor that's installed in so many uh, commercial buildings, uh, hospitals, schools, universities the same messages. We remove germs, we don't spread them. 
study showed that mopping a hard surface floor can spread as many contaminants as they remove. So selling the deep cleaning method, message, obviously any restaurant, any commercial restaurant, I mean restaurant, any commercial restroom is a potential place for selling this message. Lord knows that most commercial restrooms could use your rotary hard surface tool going across them on a periodic basis to keep them cleaner. And then the shiny floors that everyone thinks, I, I shined it, I ran my auto scrubber off it, I don't need it. If you go into any Home Depot or any Lowe's or any of these polished concretes, unless they polished it a week ago, you're gonna be able to take your cleaning wand and you're gonna write your initials in their quote unquote clean, clean looking floor. Restaurants, big issue. You know, most restaurants aren't big enough that they use auto scrubbers. If, the, if they do, that's good because that's certainly a step better than a mop. But if they're just mopping them, they're just spreading the contamination around. And then as I mentioned, some of the high surface floors. You can also use these to do EDDM every day, every, that's a, the USPS uh, Postal Service where you can for about 20 cents plus the printing cost, send postcards out to everyone in the area around a business or a home. I think EDDM may be just residential homes, but uh, you can also use them as reminder postcards. And then if you haven't seen it, ChemDry has done just an outstanding video on tile and stove cleaning. Go to YouTube and just uh, put in the search bar, ChemDry tile and stone cleaning. We don't have time to show it here and it's probably copyrighted material anyway, but since it's on YouTube, you can certainly go take a look at it. If you have a chance to make a video, it is one of those cartoon-based videos, but obviously listen to the message that they're doing. Many of you have before and after videos that talk about how great you are. That's a start, but try and add to that video some of the messages that we've been talking about today, that deep cleaning is a, a, a health improvement process. Who do you partner with? Well, one, there's three different groups that the people that I talked to said that they typically point their customers to in partnering or doing referral programs with. Maid services, flooring retailers, and flooring installers come into consideration for that. And then some other potential marketing steps that you can consider. One expert that I talked to said he doesn't recommend SEO optimization a lot for hard surface floors because typically people don't put in their search bar deep cleaning terms for hard surface floors. Where they do professional carpet cleaning or carpet cleaning, they don't do professional tile cleaning or tile cleaning because they think they know how to do it. But take a look at some of the YouTube videos that are out there and see how you can do it. You can still download our certificate of treatment. If you're taking the steps to deep clean or apply a disinfectant to your cleaning tools, hoses that you're taking into the building, make sure that you're re providing that safety and security message. We introduced this in our last webinar, a, a, a health grade, a certificate of clean and healthy to give to your commercial clients that are hiring you to deep clean their hard surface floors. It's a great way. But once again, coming back to what we started with, demo, demo, demo. Make the unobvious obvious. Couple of sources, if you're <coughs> looking for some places that can customize brochures from start to finish, hitmanadvertising.com, prolificprints.com are just a couple that are available that understand our industry. And we've already talked about some of the delivery systems. We talked about newsletters and uh, your emails, websites, the postcards and reminder postcards and EDDM, partnership and referrals, social media, getting these ads and videos and special offers onto your thing. 
And I want to remind you that if you're not familiar, if this is totally a new concept to you, Hydromaster does make a complete line of hard surface cleaning chemicals, including a chemical that's made for stone. You can't use your typical tile cleaning chemical on stone. They, as, as, as uh, Dane mentioned, many of them have calcium. And if you use a hard surface cleaning chemical that contains a water conditioning agent on stone, you'll damage it. So you got, we have a complete line and the, when Dane was talking about that, where to draw the line, oftentimes it's by the selection of products. If these types of products, this set of products doesn't give you everything you need to deep clean or correct, take care of that hard surface floor, that might be a job you want to walk away from or refer to a specialist. So we've thrown a lot of information at you in the last 95 minutes. And, uh, I know that sometimes these types of webinars can raise more questions than answers, especially if you're totally new to this. So Dane, why don't you tell them about the, the, the teaching and consulting services that you have available online now and classroom uh, um, classes. Uh, tell them a little bit more about your formal training because I know there's a lot of people who need to attend an IICRC stone masonry and tile course. Oh, I agree with that 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was actually the task force chairman back in the early 2000, I think 2000, uh, the year 2000, we started putting the SMT course together. And I remained chairman of that TAC uh, for a long time, you know, up until still today. And so I'm, I'm very excited to be able to do these uh, courses online. As a matter of fact, I got an SMT course coming up next week, Wednesday and Thursday, June 24th and 25th online. And the ISRC limits the amount of people on the online courses to 20. So you might want to go, it's, it's a simple uh, danegregory.com. You can click on classes and you can uh, register right there. It'll give you the link and I'll send you all the information you need to be, to be a part of that. But then I also do a lot of consulting with smaller companies that want to get involved and understand. Because uh, what I've learned over the course of my time here is it's always about sales and marketing. Uh, everybody here knows how to clean things. There, there's no issues there. It's always because we need to know more about sales and marketing. And that's kind of what I focus on is getting people to understand this is how you make that happen. So if you reach out info at danegregory.com or either or dane at danegregory.com, any one of those emails will get you into my inbox. And I'd love to respond back to you and see if we could put something together to go work for you. Um, I've had over 35 years in this industry and I haven't seen everything yet, although I'm getting close, I think, uh, to seeing most of it. Uh, but I've made a lot of mistakes, too, and I always share those with people, let them know that mistakes are things you learn from. And so if we can do that and we can figure out a way to make it work, everyone has a different definition of success. We try to figure out what yours is and get you there. So thanks, though. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely, Dane. Thank you so much for your time today. It, you know, and it's never been easier. Just www.danegregory.com. Click on the class. I even did it. I kind of went through the process. So I took a look at Dane's website. If I can sign up for this class, it's not too complicated for you to sign up for this class. So don't be afraid to do that. And you've got, you'll have future classes. If they can't make the one upcoming, you keep a regular uh, course lineup on these, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, it may not be up there today, but I've got more coming up in July and August also. Okay. So, yeah, and then the perhaps in like September, October, when we get back to some level of normalcy, uh, you'll probably have some on-location classes available again then, right? Yes. And I'll, I'll be at the experience also uh, doing some, some uh, programs for, uh, for them too. So come and see those. And then, yeah, well, hopefully we get live again. We get to leave the house and go see people and have fun and have dinner and all that. You know, I'm looking forward to that. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity, I've had the chance to watch several of these online classes and you may be shying away from them because you think how in the world, for instance, how can Dane teach me how to do an acid sensitivity test on stone without me being in the room? And uh, Dane and Sean and some of the guys that have put these on, on room cl uh, online classes together, it's amazing what they've put in there. I think in some ways, they might be more valuable than, than classroom settings simply because you really can zero in on stuff and show everybody up close 
what's going on and uh, it's it's good stuff so don't uh, the, if you've shied away from these online classes go give them a try and for those of you that are obviously owners and you need to get your technicians trained this is a fantastic opportunity to not have to send your technicians away for several days you can watch them as they're sitting in uh, in front of the computer learning and make sure they stay engaged and you don't have to put them up at hotels and pay for food. It's a, it's a great opportunity. So www.danegregory.com, right, Dane? That's correct. Thanks. All sir. right, sounds good. Well, I wanted to remind everybody, we will be sending you links. Uh, we will be sending you a link to the video of this presentation as soon as we're done with it. You can go through it and watch it again. We're sending you the step-by-step -step procedures for pre-inspection, the step-by-step -step procedures for cleaning, information about all the other things and then all the marketing assets that we had an opportunity to spend time with you today we're going to follow this up um, as i mentioned in two weeks uh coming up on june tuesday june the 30th we have a rug webinar with uh, doug heiferman and tom monahan if you're attending today you'll get more information about that if you'd like to sign up for it and then we're looking at doing a, a one more webinar in july that that uh, I'm, Dane doesn't even know I'm gonna ask him to participate in, but I've already talked Barry Costa and Sean Bassayon into it. It's gonna be kind of a, a, a follow-up on the marketing campaign, and we're gonna address something that I hear all the time. We're gonna spend an hour talking about how to market your IICRC certification. Because for those of us that have spent at least part or most of our careers in the education side of our industry, it pains us when somebody says, well, nobody called me and it's asked if I was certified. That's not how it works. As the lady in the Geico commercial said, that's not how any of this works. So coming up in July, keep an eye out for, we're gonna do a webinar. We're gonna invite uh, a couple of people from the IACRC to join us too. And we're gonna zero in on marketing, but specifically marketing your IICRC certification. So Dane, I kind of surprised you with that, but uh, I'd love for you to participate in that because I know it's something that's near and dear to your heart too. So, all right, I wanna thank everybody for coming today and thank you for attending. Mike, thanks for listening in and chiming in on the ATP. Um, Mike has spent, has he mentioned to you his whole career in, in uh, the Jansan side of the world and is just a, a great source of knowledge. You can reach uh, Mike and I through Hydromaster or you've got the contact information for Dane. Dane, did you have anything you wanted to share with everybody before we depart today? Well, thanks everybody for being here. And, and uh, in these really crazy times, it's nice to know that there's still people out there that are willing to learn and, and, uh, and, and see things out there. So just stay safe, everybody. And Keep your social distance, and hopefully we'll see you at the experience in September. That sounds great. Thank you, Dane. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. All right. Take care, and we'll talk to everyone soon. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Bye.